I indulge myself by being optimistic about the future of our species. Do you as well? Do you sometimes look up at the night sky or at the arc of the Milky Way and wonder what is beyond our planet, what is out there in our solar system or beyond our solar system? Or more specifically, do you ask yourself when we'll have the technology to go there, to go beyond our planet, to maybe land on Mars one day? I know that as an engineering student, I ask myself a question almost every single day. I actually remember being a seven-year-old boy and discussing with my father and, and him telling me that we had never gone past the moon. And uh, first of all, that made me quite disappointed as a seven-year-old. Um, but I also remember frantically realizing, okay, okay, like what can I do to, to build the next spacecraft to go to Mars or to go to some other planet? And, and I've been doing that ever since. <laughs> But when I look back at that question of, of when we'll have the technology to go there, I realize that it, it shouldn't be and isn't the sole question. I think a more interesting question to ask ourselves is when we will be ready as a global society to go elsewhere in our solar system. And I think that to do that, we need to think of space as a very interdisciplinary um, endeavor, as something that we think of holistic. So, before going into it, I'd like to give sort of the past of the space industry and where it, where it sort of began. So on October 4th, 1957, uh, the USSR launched the very first satellite, Sputnik 1. Um, therefore starting basically the space race. Now some of you may have heard of this race. Um, some of you may have heard of this, this race between the USSR and the US. To Um, some of you may have heard of this race between the USSR and the US to basically um, reach space as fast as possible to, uh, for ideological superiority. Now, not long after uh, the USSR launched their um, satellite into space, the US put a man on the moon, ending the space race, basically, in 1969. Now, in the midst of the Cold War and in the midst of this uh, race to, to space, there was a treaty that was signed. And that is the Treaty on Outer Space. So in a way, this, this treaty was kind of what marked the end of the space race. And part of its many principles is to think of space as more of a peaceful endeavor. You see, one of the main principles was that we weren't going to allow any country from putting uh, weapons of mass destruction in space, thankfully. So this was actually a really good example of space becoming interdisciplinary or <coughs> being thought of as an inter interdisciplinary venture. You see, between the politicians, the engineers, the mathematicians, the physicists that had to come together to build this treaty, it was a really good start to thinking of space as a wholesome endeavor and giving voice to the different uh, disciplines. So where, is this space, where does the space industry stand as, as of today? Some of you may have heard of SpaceX and Blue Origin uh, with their landing rockets. Uh, the space industry is becoming quite privatized um, as of today, the industry is worth 329 billion U.S. dollars, and it's mostly operated by satellites, and while well, the manufacturing and operation of satellites. In fact, all of you today in the room or online are probably interacting with space, be it with your cell phones or with the internet. But what does that mean for the space industry? It, it means that great success, because we're going to become more and more of a connected society, more and more of a connected world. Which means, again, great success, but, but also more and more space pollution. Now, some of you may be aware of this um, issue called space debris, space debris pollution. So, this is a problem that we're facing right now. The space industry is facing this issue of having too many objects in space. In fact, there are 18,000 objects that are tracked, and only 1,500 of them are actual operational satellites. So this is an issue that, that we really are facing today, and, and I can't help but ask myself the question when I see something like this, whether or not it could have been mitigated if we would have thought of it earlier on, if we would have considered space as more of an, of an interdisciplinary venture, if we would have maybe included the different schools of thought together to come up with a solution earlier to mitigate the problem now. So, you know, as like all accidents, hindsight is twenty twenty. But one must ask the question whether or not critical, holistic thinking could have been one of the solutions to this problem. Where is the space industry going in the future? 
So again, SpaceX um, is probably here to stay with their landing rockets and the privatization of space is going to become more and more evident. Uh, there are companies like Spire or Planet Labs that are developing nanosatellites to take images of the Earth and sell them, or GSI that plans to uh, mine asteroids, um, or Blue Origin that will that will be doing some uh, space tourism. So actually, a lot of people will assume that that the industry becoming privatized immediately means the death of governmental agencies like NASA. But keep calm, NASA is doing just fine. Um, there's just one difference, or one main difference between both of them in the example of going to Mars, is that SpaceX is adopting more of a, say, direct and potentially unsafe uh, approach to sending a man on Mars by 2024. Whereas NASA is approaching this more of a, like a stepping stone approach, and it can be argu arguable, but it's supposed to be a little safer. It will just get us to Mars a lot, a lot later. So all of these projects are, are extremely interesting and excite the hell out of me. But I'm an engineer, and as you can see, a lot of the products that I mentioned are extremely exciting for engineers. I believe that, that the direct approach that these privatized companies are, are approaching is, is extremely interesting, but may be dangerous, and we may not be thinking about all the questions today that could help us prevent for challenges tomorrow. So speaking of which, what does it really mean to say, involving disciplines today to prepare for tomorrow. So I'd like to give you some, some context and maybe, maybe some examples of the future where involving a discipline today could really help us you know, prevent challenges tomorrow. Starting with sort of the political aspect or the governance of outer space. Now some of you may be aware of some of the universities that teach space law, um, McGill being one of them. We have an institute called the McGill Institute for Air and Space Law. And the main connection between all these different universities is that they all teach this, this um, degree of, of space law at a post-undergraduate level. So I believe that involving young, younger students, undergraduate students, for example, in political science, and making them aware of the potential problems of the future is crucial. In fact, I think that limiting ourselves to, to just post-undergraduate means potentially uh, lacking the diversity that we need for a, a global common that space is. Um, so, and I, I also would like to argue that I'm sure a lot of a lot of younger people want to know why Elon Musk, the CEO and founder of SpaceX, can't just land on Mars and claim it his. Um, so, m moving forward with another example um, that that could come up in the future is is space medicine. So we've had had we've had talks today about medicine. Um, and, and space medicine is a really erudite field. There are not many universities that specialize themselves in space medicine. And if they do specialize in any sort of way, most of the time we just discuss the effects of zero-g on a human being, which um, are quite important from the loss of eyesight to the loss of bone density. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but there's quite a lot of different things that can happen from, from not being, from, um, not being in, in gravity. So, Space medicine is, is a field that could really be important in the future. So what happens if we get to Mars, for example, and we can't medically, or we can't live there physically? Um, what if we actually can't endure all of the different uh, aspects that our, our bodies need um, when we get there? And so I, I personally believe that it's possible, but I also believe in preparing for that to in, involve this discipline to prepare for tomorrow. So uh, medicine isn't just about the physical aspect, there's also the care for, for the mind, which is mostly the psychological aspect. Again, I ask the question, what if we arrive on Mars, we arrive on another planet, and we can't psychologically handle the idea of not being in touch with nature or, or breathable air that isn't created by some transformer, right? But what if we can't psychologically handle the idea of being excluded from our society Again, this is a, a discipline that could be involved more today to prepare for tomorrow. I, again, I believe in the idea of, of us going to another planet and potentially colonizing another planet, but we need to think about these type of issues today. And my final example is, is on the, the theme of ethics. So it isn't because we can do something that we should do it. 
So say we, we do figure out a way of going there medically and to the, you know, and we've also thought about all the political aspects of, of leaving our planet and of uh, coloniz colonizing another planet. Is it, first of all, is it ethical for us to even do space travel and to have humans go through all the challenges that is space travel? But more specifically, is it ethical to, for example, go to Mars and have a child on Mars? We're basically forcing this, this infant or this child to go through all of the social and psychological and mental and um, physical challenges that lay ahead for this child. So is it ethical for us to do that? So again, it's another discipline that could be, again, involved more today to prepare for tomorrow. All these challenges will definitely arise at some point. It's just a matter of preparing. So all of the examples that I just gave are sort of interconnected, right? Between the idea of, um, of using our, poli our political science more in the, in the idea of space, um, but which, by the way, I didn't mention, but, but another interesting point about, about political science is, is how, do we, how are we going to characterize a newborn on another planet on a political level? What kind of citizenship will they have if they are born on Mars, right? So from that to the idea of us even being able to live on another planet, like, like physically, um, to psychologically being able to handle it, to the ethical aspect of even having a child on Mars or, or living outside of Earth. So I believe in, in humans exploring the unknown. In fact, I, I really think that that is what we're here to do. We're here to explore the unknown, and we are all drawn towards that idea of the unknown. And uh, here at McGill, we've sort of created a group um, called the McGill Space Group, McGill Space Systems Group, that's formed of a bunch of different students from political science to education to engineering, geography, math, physics, and for me, that is really the beginning of, of, of it all. It's, it's at the root of knowledge, or, I, or at the root of knowledge, which is education, to involving as many different people as possible to prepare today for the challenges we might be facing tomorrow. So I encourage all of you, regardless of what you study, regardless of your discipline or of your expertise, I encourage you to think about the ways that you or your discipline could potentially prepare today for tomorrow. For, for humans becoming a multi-planetary species. Thank you.